It seems unimaginable that someone we may personally know or are related to could be committing atrocities without us ever knowing. It's even more unimaginable that after the capture and conviction of a felonious relative or friend, that there could be a second person in our life with the same murderous instincts. In today's brief history, we'll be discussing two crimes that feature members of the same family. This is A Brief History of Michael Madison. As always, this episode of A Brief History contains graphic content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. In this episode, we will be building the home of Diane Madison, the mother of convicted killer Michael Madison. Michael Madison was born on October 15, 1977 in Cleveland, Ohio, to parents Diane Madison and John Baldwin. Though John Baldwin denied being the father and has never had contact with his alleged son, Michael's childhood trauma wouldn't stop at the denial of his parentage, and in fact, at his later trial, the defense would cite numerous childhood traumas as a catalyst for Michael's future behavior. Diane Madison had suffered a traumatic life herself prior to giving birth to the eventual killer. Diane's father left the family at a young age and her mother turned to drugs and prostitution to cope. After giving birth to Michael, Diane was a single mother, and her parenting skills were tenuous at best. It's alleged that she skipped over holidays and birthdays, frequently brought men into the household as her boyfriend of the week, and allowed the men, who were mostly transients, to discipline Michael as well as his half-brother. It was in 1980 that child services visited the Madison household to find that Diane had been stuffing food down the throat of a young toddler Michael until he vomited. After vomiting, he was placed in a hot tub of water and then beaten with an extension cord when he started screaming. The children were not removed from the home but were visited again a year later when Michael was found to have bruising across his forehead. Months later, child services visited yet again, after a three-year-old Michael was beaten by one of his mother's many boyfriends so badly that he lost hearing in one ear. Reports also showed that he suffered from contusions, abrasions, and swelling on his penis. Child services finally removed him from the home, but placed him with his drug-addicted prostitute grandmother. Eventually, after counseling and therapy, Michael returned to live with his mother, but the abuse continued. Since Michael was so young at the time, he later recalled that he wasn't able to remember much of the abuse, which is not uncommon in such young victims. But it is thought that the dissociation he experienced from his childhood trauma fueled his disgust towards women. By the time Michael was 16, he was living on his own wherever he could find a place to sleep and by 17, he was arrested for the first time. Michael was charged as a teenager with inappropriately touching a classmate, and he would only escalate from there. At the age of 20, he was arrested on his first drug charge, and only a few years later, he would be placed on the sex offender's registry for an attempted rape. In October 2001, Michael Madison had dragged an 18-year-old woman down the streets of East Cleveland, threw her behind a house, and attempted to rape her, only to be stopped almost immediately by police. While in prison, Michael underwent a sex offender's treatment and was eventually released back into society. In 2013, however, Michael's crimes would escalate. In July of 2013, neighbors began calling in reports of a horrible stench coming from a garage that was later found to be leased to Michael Madison. Within the garage, police found the decomposing body of a young woman. Just a day later, two more bodies were discovered within 200 yards around the garage, one in a backyard and another in the basement of a vacant house. The bodies were found exceptionally close together, wrapped in plastic bags, and seemed to be clearly connected as far as M.O. was concerned. A search warrant was issued for Michael Madison's apartment, and while Michael wasn't there himself, the police did find evidence of decomposition within his apartment. Michael Madison, knowing the police were hot on his trail, returned to his mother Diane's home and had a short standoff with police before eventually being apprehended. In the murders of Satisha Sheely, Angela Deskins, and Sherelda Helen Terry, 
Michael was charged with two counts of aggravated murder for each victim, three counts of kidnapping, three counts of gross abuse of a corpse, a single count of rape, and a weapons possession charge. Michael pled not guilty to all charges, but after a single day of deliberation, the jury found him guilty on 13 charges and recommended the death penalty. In June of 2016, Michael Madison was sentenced to the death penalty, and during the sentencing caused a commotion when he smirked while his sentence was being announced. The father of victim Sherelle DeTerry lunged at Madison within the courthouse, but was released with no charges. Last year, on July 21, 2020, the Ohio Supreme Court voted to uphold the death penalty on Michael Madison, and he is still on death row today. Having one family member who turned out to be a killer should have been the end for Diane Madison. But in a shocking turn of events, in June of 2019, Diane Madison was stabbed to death in her home, where she lived with three of her grandkids, one of them being the son of Michael himself. It was in the same home that Michael Madison had barricaded himself in during the standoff with police that Diane was murdered in. Diane's 18-year-old grandson, Jalen Plummer, stabbed his grandmother to death and attempted to stab to death her other three grandchildren as well. The children did survive, but were seriously injured. Jalen Plummer was charged with the murder of Diane Madison, as well as three counts of attempted murder but a resolution has not been found yet and a motive for the crime has not been found either. Could murderous instincts run in a family? Did Diane possibly abuse her grandchildren as well, essentially forcing her eldest grandson to act? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for joining me for this episode of A Brief History. Thank you to my patrons, you are so appreciated. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more true crime Sims content. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.